Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's talk about what happened last night. We had a mixed night. Bernard Hopkins delivered for us, but the casino beat me up on the Keith Thurman fight. Let's talk about both. First, though, let's put urban mythology to bed. Right, I know Bernard Hopkins, and I know it's a great storyline, is talking about having retired Don King, right? Um, you heard it on the telecast yesterday on HBO, everyone talking about how Tavares Cloud was the last jewel in the King empire, and that were he to lose, Don King would effectively be out of boxing. Now, that makes good theater, it's just not right. Right? We call it as we see it here online. Don King's actually putting on the cruiserweight fight between Marco Huck and Afalabi. Right? And so my point is this. Don King's still in the mix. Keep in mind, too, that, you know, Don King still has a name. Tavares Cloud still has a future. He's only 31 years old. It's a setback for Don King, no question about it. But retiring Don King is going to take a lot more than this last fight. Now let's talk about the fight. Uh, Hopkins delivered for us. He was the underdog in the fight. You got plus 140 and higher by taking Hopkins. Right? The bet I recommended before the fight was to take Hopkins to win hedged against the under 9.5 rounds. I thought that Tavares Cloud if he was going to win this fight, was going to have to do so by knockout early. He didn't get the knockout. Hopkins won the fight. Both sides of the bet were better than even money. You should have a nice profit in your bank account today if this is the only fight you bet on last night. Now let's talk about the sweet science. right? The casinos always overvalue youth punching power, explosiveness, right? The better the guy's highlights, the more overrated he's going to be at the casino, right? Understand, Tavares Cloud was a minus 170, right? Just, you know, know that it's my theory that if you have punching power and you have dramatic highlights, right, and you're explosive, people are going to think you have more game than you do. Let's talk about the concept of game. Understand that there's more to boxing than punching power and explosiveness. Right? There's literally a whole part of the game that takes place between punches. And that's where Bernard Hopkins, quite frankly, is a master. Right? Just imagine you're Tavares Cloud for a moment. I'm, let me disagree with HBO from last night. I've seen fights where Tavares Cloud has used an explosive left hand. Tavares Cloud, to me, is two-handed, right? I know on the telecast they were saying, oh, he doesn't throw the left hook that often. I'll tell you what, take a look at the Glenn Johnson fight. That looks like a two-handed attack to me. So let's give Cloud the credit he deserves. Let's say you're Tavares Cloud. You're in your early 30s. Let's say this is before the fight. You're wearing the belt and it's earned. You've beaten people like Clinton Woods. In other words, no one gave you the belt. You didn't walk in the back door. You actually walked in the front door. You've earned the belt. What's given you the belt is punching power in both hands, right? You are an explosive mid-range hooker with a jab, right? You can take people out. Glenn Johnson, who never gets knocked out, was in serious trouble in that fight, right? We're talking about an explosive puncher. Here's the difference between him and Bernard Hopkins, right? Just imagine your cloud, but you need to set your feet before you throw hard punches, right? That's a big difference between the Tavares clouds of the world and let's say the Ali's of the world or the Bernard Hopkinses. 
because simply that fact by itself that Cloud has to set his feet before he throws power shots, right? It's his below the waist game, right? Just the fact that he needs that moment to set his feet enables Bernard Hopkins to literally use lateral movement. Bernard's moving around the ring. And because Bernard is an older fighter, he's not a younger guy who has a lot of energy. He's an older fighter who has to conserve his energy. Bernard Hopkins isn't galloping around the ring. We're not talking about Andre Durrell against Carl Frotch. We're not talking about the later rounds of Amir Khan against Marcus Maidana. No, we're talking about a guy who's craftier than that. You heard Andre Ward, who had a great night, say it on the telecast. Bernard Hopkins literally is walking around the ring. He's not galloping. He's walking. He's conserving energy. But he's moving just enough between punches so that Tavares Cloud, who if he just has a second, will have his gun ready to fire, has to keep resetting. So he needs a second here. Bernard moves. He needs a second here. Bernard moves. He needs a second here. You want to know why fighters against Bernard Hopkins have lower volume than they do in other fights? It's because Hopkins is keeping you resetting. And Hopkins, the minute he sees a little bit of an opening, he doesn't need that much time to get off punches. In fact, Bernard will be walking away from you, see an opening, and will look clumsy. He'll literally turn around and throw punches. He's ready to throw punches on a dime. So the reaction time between when these fighters are, you know, moving and are ready to throw punches, even at 48 years old for Bernard Hopkins, it's shorter than it was for Tavares Cloud. Now here's why the gap seems so pronounced during the telecast. You remember when you saw young Mike Tyson and he literally was able to move across the ring. I'm talking about young Tyson, right? He would be outside and in a blink of an eye, he was up on a guy, right? He had foot speed. In other words, Tyson could literally move. The fight would start, Tyson would be in your corner, right? He would get across the ring that quickly. If you saw a guy up on the ropes with Mike Tyson, you knew, you knew Tyson was going to come over and pin him, right? And it was interesting because as Tyson got older, he got even better with it because like Bernard Hopkins, he started to conserve energy. So even though in the Michael Spinks fight, he has Michael Spinks up on the ropes, Tyson's looking leisurely, right? But make no mistake, you knew Tyson had the foot speed. Tavares Cloud doesn't. Right? Fighters are carrying luggage in the ring. They're, they're carrying their stances. Right? They want to have a lead foot and a back foot. Right? They don't want to cross their feet. They want footwork. So what you'll notice is that even when a guy is up on the ropes just 10 feet away from them, it takes a fighter a little bit to get over there. The fighter has to shuffle a little bit to get over there. Right? Here, you had a guy who needed to reset to throw punches, who, when Hopkins would walk across the ring, took some time to get over there. Right? And so Hopkins is literally able to walk away knowing he's not fighting Prime Tyson. Right? Because if you try to walk away from a guy who has the foot speed, that guy's going to jump on you. He's going to force you to deal with him. Right? Ricky Hatton's another one. Say what you want about Ricky Hatton above the waist. Understand below the waist, Ricky Hatton moves around the ring. Right? Guys get cornered in Ricky Hatton fights. You couldn't imagine a guy fighting Ricky Hatton just walking away from Ricky Hatton and being able to walk away every round from Ricky Hatton. Right? Because Ricky Hatton, like Mike Tyson, moved across the ring. Tavares crowds a bit too leisurely across the ring. He didn't really have the foot speed to kind of like 
race across the ring and catch up with Bernard Hopkins. He had another problem, too. You know, when you're watching a Vladimir Klitschko fight, and I'm just naming big-name fighters who have certain styles. Let's say you're watching a Vladimir Klitschko fight, and Vladimir Klitschko is behind a jab, and he's back here, right? But Vladimir Klitschko has an overhand straight right hand, right? He has, he has a right hand that he can literally throw from halfway across the ring, right? You may have seen fights where he just touches a guy, and then suddenly he throws a right hand. It's straight, and it literally comes from downtown across the ring and hits an opponent. Look at the Vladimir Klitschko-Calvin Brock fight, how Brock gets knocked out, right? Klitschko can extend. He literally can travel across the ring on a punch, right? Guys with that long right hand, Canelo, long right hand. They can literally throw that right hand and hit you. They have what I call long power. So if you're in front of them using lateral movement, you got to be vigilant Because you understand that being three feet away from the guy doesn't ensure that you're not going to get hit with that long range power. In my opinion, I know it's controversial, Deveris Cloud doesn't have that long overhand right. In other words, Bernard Hopkins understood that he could control distance because Cloud's game is predominantly mid-range. He doesn't have the long-range part of his game. Right? Another guy who's excellent long-range shots, David Hay. Right? David Hay, Audley Harrison. David Hay's outside. He's in the middle of the ring and stuff. Suddenly, boom! comes in, you know, covers about five feet, throwing an overhand haymaker, right? You know, just jumps in. You know, also David Hay against um, Nikolai Valuev, right? Fakes one hand, comes in with the other. The other guy is a tall giant feet away from David Hay, but David Hay can jump in and hit him. If you're fighting a guy who you know doesn't have that long power, is predominantly local power, then you could literally stand a few feet in front of him and feel comfortable that he's not going to hit you. You don't have to waste energy worrying about being hit from halfway across the ring. That's what it seemed to me like Hopkins was doing. I was a bit surprised that Cloud didn't try to push the issue a little bit more, didn't try to just walk up to Hopkins a little bit more. You know, walk up to Hopkins, Hopkins isn't a puncher, figure out what you're going to do after you close the gap. I thought that Cloud had a problem closing the gap. In fact, it looked to me like you saw the fact that Cloud had only been with his new trainer for two and a half months, right? Cloud didn't look that comfortable in the ring to me. Right? He didn't he didn't seem to move that fast. He didn't corner Bernard Hopkins. Hopkins is even lounging out by the ropes. Right? Hopkins is using the entire ring. Here is Hopkins against a puncher. And he's figured out what punches the puncher can throw. And he's actually up against the ropes some rounds. Just loitering over there. Right? You know, I also thought it was interesting that Hopkins, when Cloud would throw a punch and miss was literally able to come in not just with solo shots, but with combinations, right? All I'm saying is when a guy is coming in with combinations, leaving himself open, because as you're throwing a combination, right, you're throwing punches. It involves both of your hands. You don't have a hand up to block stuff. That told me that Hopkins had figured out Cloud's pattern, and he knew he could come in with combinations against a hook artist, knowing that he wasn't going to get hit with anything brick coming back. So I'll say this. Tavares Cloud has a bright future in the sport. He just needs to fight guys who don't have the lateral movement of a Bernard Hopkins. That lateral movement literally killed him. Right? He just couldn't handle the fact that Hopkins never stayed in front of him. Right, Hopkins was here, 
Hopkins was here. He would turn this way. Hopkins would come back here, right? Cloud was so confused that when Cloud got hit with a great left hook by Bernard Hopkins that opened up a cut, Cloud thought it was an elbow, right? Cloud couldn't figure out the angles. Hopkins must have looked like he was off at the side to Cloud the entire fight. And because Cloud throws short punches, not looping punches, Cloud didn't have the coverage that Keith Thurman had on his punches. Let's talk about Keith Thurman. And keep in mind, as I've said before, boxing's rock, paper, scissors, right? I can say looping punches are a bad thing. But in some fights, they're a great thing. Let me say, with Thurman, the bet I recommended was the under nine and a half rounds. Hedged against Zavik, five to one underdog, to win the fight. My logic was simply that Keith Thurman is an explosive power puncher who had never gone past the eighth round. I thought that if Thurman was going to get a knockout, it was going to be early in the fight. Right? Had Thurman gotten the early knockout, we would have been protected. In fact, not that early a knockout, nine and a half rounds. Had he gotten a knockout before the midway point of the 10th round, I would have been protected. I thought that Zavik had a chance to take him to the later rounds. And I thought that if Zavik pushed the issue and got to the later rounds, I thought Thurman was going to fall apart. I was expecting Thurman to look like a knockout artist, an early round knockout artist, in the deep end of the pool, and I was expecting that, um, Thurman to drown in the later rounds if it got to the later rounds, right? Let me just say this. Keith Thurman surprised me. He looked infinitely much better in the later rounds than I had ever imagined, right? Zavik, rough and tumble, a lot of heart, just like I said in a pre-fight video, actually went the distance with Keith Thurman, right? He's the first man to go 12 rounds with Keith Thurman because this is the first Keith Thurman fight to go 12 rounds. In fact, this is the first Keith Thurman fight to go 10 rounds, right? Zavik showed a lot of heart. Zavik pushed the issue. Zavik fought exactly the kind of fight that I thought he would. He's coming forward on Keith Thurman. He's trying to push the issue. Here's the problem. Keith Thurman does have a back foot game, right? Keith Thurman is explosive and has ring coverage. In other words, Keith Thurman is back here. When Keith Thurman throws, you know, a left hook or right hook, he can literally do so from three feet in front of you. He doesn't have to be that close to you, right? And he's athletic. He can move around the ring, right? I tip my hat to Keith Thurman. He had Zavik covering up for much of the fight. There were at least a couple times in this fight where Keith Thurman from outside would come in with a hook and knock Zavik's mouthpiece out, right? Zavik was doing the best he could fighting a nuclear bomb. Right? Zavik's hanging in there. There were a few rounds where Zavik looked like he was coming on only to get clubbed with some Keith Thurman hard shots. Right? Let me just say, most men would not have gone the distance with Keith Thurman yesterday. It's only because Zavik is excellent defensively. Right? Has his head down, has his hands up, you know, is protecting his face. It's only because Zavik is a defensive master that he was able to to pull it off. I agree Thurman won almost all of the rounds. I know the judges gave him every round. I thought Zavik won at least two rounds in the fight. I know YouTube Nation is going to disagree with me, but I will say it's very rare to see a fighter who has never made it to the ninth round in a world-class fight against a champion who's as determined as Zavik. It's very rare to see a young guy literally look as good in the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th rounds as Keith Thurman did. The casino beat me on that one. I'll have to, you know, live with the split. Uh, the win on the Hopkins fight, a loss on this fight. Um, got beat up on that Keith Thurman fight. Uh, about as beat up as Zan, uh, Zavik got. I'll just say this, though. 
Zavik still has a lot of gas left in the tank, right? He's very good defensively. This Keith Thurman matchup, he was facing one of the most gifted offensive fighters at 147 pounds. You need to understand that Keith Thurman, quite frankly, is a prodigy. He's an unbeaten fighter, right? Understand, too, that as good as Keith Thurman looked on his back foot yesterday, he's actually even better on his front foot. He uh, couldn't totally unveil his front foot game yesterday because Zavik was too good defensively. In other words, he would come forward, Zavik was all deed up. So Thurman went to plan B, and of course with plan B, the judges gave him every round in the fight, right? Zavik was too good defensively to be knocked out. But Thurman is definitely someone who vastly exceeded my expectations. And let me just say, comparing the two guys, Tavares Cloud and Keith Thurman, Thurman moves better than Cloud. Thurman has more long-range power than Cloud. There are going to be fights where the extra loop, Cloud throws the shorter punches. There are going to be fights where the extra loop in Thurman's punch costs him, right? Because an extra loop against a guy like Bernard Hopkins would give X, uh, Hopkins more time to counter you. But there are also going to be fights like yesterday when he's fighting a rabbit ears opponent and the, you know his ability to throw looping but accurate power shots from halfway across the ring will give him an opportunity to break down a defensive fighter right so I give Keith Thurman all the credit in the world he did much better than I thought he would um, Bernard Hopkins is Bernard Hopkins let me just say folks you know if you look at his record it's astonishing understand forget his middleweight career where he's one of history's dominant middleweight champions let's just look at his light heavyweight record understand that he fighting three light heavyweight champions who won their belts independently of him in other words this isn't a light heavyweight champ who's defending his belt this is a guy who is visiting the light heavyweight division after a lengthy middleweight career who has taken on four different light heavyweight champions right he's beaten three of them Antonio Tarver was so cocky before his match with Bernard Hopkins that I believe the two men bet a quarter million dollars on whether Tarver would knock out Hopkins in the first part of the fight. I believe it's sometime in the first six rounds. Tarver had to pay that bet. Understand too, when Hopkins fought Tarver, Tarver was widely regarded as the light heavyweight champion. Right? Then Hopkins comes back, fights Jean Pascal when Pascal has the title. Right? Independent of Hopkins. Pascal has the light heavyweight title. The first fight's a draw. Hopkins wins the second fight. Now Hopkins has come back and he's fought Tavares Cloud. Now, in my opinion, Cloud lost to Gabriel Campillo. Officially, Cloud was unbeaten. But understand, here again, Cloud independently had the light heavyweight title. And you know the rest. Hopkins beats Cloud, and let me just say, none of those three fights, Tarver, the Pascal rematch, or this Cloud fight, were close. Hopkins won all of those fights by multiple rounds. It's simply astonishing. It is only Chad Dawson, who I've been saying for years here, is one of the best pound for pound in the sport. He's still on my pound for pound list. You can look it up, right? It's only Chad Dawson who gave Hopkins problems. And even in that fight, Hopkins went the distance, right? And so all I can say is um, this, you know, 
it's reached the point where Hopkins has gone from being a novelty act in the light heavyweight division to now being someone who, if you're a heavyweight champ, you're risking your credibility if you don't fight Bernard Hopkins, right? Nathan Cleverly, if you're watching this video, I doubt you are, but if you're watching this video, you need to ask yourself how in your prime, in your division, Bernard Hopkins is repeatedly fighting more high quality opponents than you are. How is it that Bernard Hopkins is able to fight all these champions? And we haven't seen Nathan Cleverly fight a Jean Pascal or fight a Tavares Cloud. Let me just say too, I've long criticized Cleverly for sprouting roots on the canvas, for lacking in movement. This is what happens when a guy with a fast break game, I know Hopkins isn't high volume on the punch count, but he's fast break in the ring, right? He's moving around the ring. This is what happens when the sport, culturally, ends up with guys standing and sprouting roots in the can on the canvas, and some old school guy with movement enters the mix, and these young guys aren't prepared for it, right? So all I can say is, Bernard Hopkins is a threat to anyone at light heavy, right? Um, and uh, really, you know, this fight was pretty much over. By the time we got to round 10, it was clear that Hopkins had cracked Cloud's code, that Hopkins knew Cloud's punch patterns, that Hopkins felt comfortable. You, you always know when an older guy is really comfortable because the guy starts dropping his hands. And, and, and Hopkins was up on the ropes. Just the fact that he's in with a puncher and he's voluntarily up on the ropes. Can you imagine doing that against Prime Tyson or Rocky Marciano? He's up on the ropes and then he has his hands low. That told you late in this fight that in Hopkins' mind, he was in the ring with a guy who, quite frankly, was not on his level. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. I think Tavares Cloud has a bright future against fighters who don't have Hopkins' lateral movement. Let me hear from you. Thanks for watching.